turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 as we continue our study. Philippians chapter 1, our study finding joy in the real battles of life. And today we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about finding joy in the midst of suffering. You know, nobody likes to suffer. Suffering is never a pleasant experience for anybody anywhere on the face of the earth at any time. Throughout history, there have been lots and lots of people that have suffered for the cause of Christ and, and had remarkable testimonies because of it, but it's never a pleasant experience, okay? And, um, and, and it's difficult, and yet the Apostle Paul, who suffered, who suffered, um, was, was able to talk about joy in the midst of his suffering. But, you know, the Apostle Paul seems like he was a positive person, doesn't he? I like to hang out with positive people. When I was young, early in the ministry, um, I used to take note of who really in the church had the gift of encouragement. And when times were tough, okay, then I would, then I would call them up and say, hey, let's, let's get together for a cup of coffee. I always like to hang out with encouragers, not negative people. Have you known negative people? They, they just complain about everything. If you, gave, if you passed out $100 bills, they'd complain that, that they only got one and they didn't get a $1,000 bill, okay? Um, it just seems like in life, nothing works out for them. I read an interesting story recently. It's kind of fitting in light of the, the religious news in the world this week with, the, with the, um, um, the, the resignation of Pope Benedict, the first time that a pope has resigned in over 600 years. This story is kind of about a negative person, okay? And, and it was about a woman. Whoops, let me go to the slide. It was about a woman at a hairdresser. I like that when I found it. The oops hairstyle for women. Okay, <laughs> who would go there? Um, but anyway, anyway, this woman was, um, was getting um, her hair done for a trip she was taking to Rome with her husband, and she mentioned the trip to the hairdresser. The hairdresser is one of those people that you just don't really like to hang out with in life, and he said, Rome? Why would anyone want to go there? It's crowded and dirty. You're crazy to go to Rome. So, so um, uh, how are you going to get there? And the woman said, well, we're taking Continental Airlines, and um, it's only because Southwest doesn't fly over there, John. And, and, and the guy said, Continental? Continental, that's a terrible airline. Um, their planes are old. The flight attendants are ugly. They're always late. Where are you going to stay in Rome? Well, the lady said, we're staying at this exclusive little place over on Rome's Tiber River called Test. And, um, the, and the guy said, don't, don't go any further. I know that place. Everybody thinks it's going to be something special and exclusive, but it's really a dump. Well, <clears throat> we're going to go see the Vatican and maybe even get to see the Pope. That's rich, laughed the hairdresser. Okay, You're, You and a million other people trying to see the Pope. Um, he, 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 when he looks out at you, you're going to look like the size of an ant to him. Um, but good luck on your lousy trip. Okay, you're going, to, you're going to need it. Well, a month later, the woman had gone with her husband. They enjoyed Rome. They came back. She's in the hairdresser again. And, she, and he says, hey, how was the trip? She said, it was wonderful. And then she told the story. Not only were we on time in one of the Continental's brand new planes, but it was overbooked, and they bumped us up to first class. Um, th the food was wonderful. I had a handsome 28-year-old steward who waited on me hand and foot. The hotel was great. They just finished a $5 million remodeling job, and, and now it's a jewel, the finest hotel in all of the city. Um, they, too, were overbooked. They apologized to us. They gave us the owner's suite at no extra charge. Well, muttered the hairdresser. That's all well and good, but I know you didn't get to see the Pope. Actually, we, we were quite uh, fortunate, the, the lady said, because on our tour of the of Vatican, a Swiss guard tapped me on the shoulder and explained that every once in a while the Pope likes to meet some of the visitors, and if I'd be so kind as to step into his private room and wait, the Pope would personally greet me. Sure enough, five minutes later, the Pope walked right on through the door, shook my hand, and he spoke a few words to me. The hairdresser said, oh, really? What did he say? And the lady said, he said, who messed up your hair? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good story. Good story. Some people are just negative about everything. Absolutely everything, okay? Not the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a person who is positive about everything in life in the midst of great difficulty. You remember what we talked about in the introduction in the first message on Philippians. The Apostle Paul's in chains. He's in a rented house, but he's in chains. He's in jail, in chains. 
He's tied to a guard all the time. He is awaiting trial that is soon coming up. He is separated from all of his friends. Now, he is able to greet visitors in this place, but he's not able to be with them to really enjoy them as one would outside of a jail setting. He knows that he may die when this trial comes about. There's a chance that he's going to be found guilty and that he's going to die. He's awaiting that final decision. And then insult to injury, folks. In our passage today, he talks about instigators who are stirring up trouble for him all around. He's not out there able to defend himself. He's not out there able to defend the gospel. He's not out there able to defend the church. And these people are rabble-rousers. They're troublemakers. And, and, and they are in the process of stirring up all the trouble that they can. And in the midst of all that, in the midst of all that, the Apostle Paul is a man of joy. Turn with me as we read our scripture reading this morning. 1 Samuel 12 through 18. Stand together. It says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of that, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Heavenly Father, as we look into the word of God this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would minister to our hearts, especially those among us who are struggling and suffering in their own way. And Lord, sometimes when we look around, everybody looks so normal and looks so good and looks so happy, but we don't know their heart and we don't know their soul and we don't know what's inside. And some of us struggle, Lord. And I pray that we might hear from you that there is good in the midst of all that. We find strength in the Lord and joy in Jesus Christ. Bless our time. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Suffering. Suffering, not a good word, okay? Suffering takes on many different faces. And as I said in my prayer, sometimes we look around and we would say, hey, Fellowship Bible Church, we're a good group. People are happy. People are cheery. I walk in to the foyer. Folks are shaking hands and getting coffee and talking and laughing and enjoying life. And certainly there is no suffering in our midst, in our presence. But suffering takes on many different faces. And in times of suffering, and I've suffered and you've suffered, in times of suffering, I have, I've heard believers attempting to be very helpful say things like, well, this is nothing uh, compared to the suffering that, um, that believers are experiencing in some other part of the remote part of the world. And probably that's true, you know, but it's true, but it's not very helpful to me in the midst of my suffering to know that somebody, somebody is suffering worse than I am. It is true that people are suffering worse, but it isn't helping me find strength in the midst of mine. In fact, persecution.org, an organization that monitors Christian persecution around the world, says in China today, now this is brand new, okay? In China today, persecution of the church has increased by 42% year over year with the continuation of a crackdown on house churches. This is looking back at last year, 2012, saying in 2012, persecution increased in China 42% over 2011 because the government of China is cracking down on people meeting in their homes. The number of people being prosecuted increased by 125% year over year. People whose only crime, only crime, folks, is that, that they met in their own living room to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's all that they did wrong. We don't know how easy it is sometimes in the United States to worship the Lord until we look around the world and we see that in other places, it's not nearly so easy. In fact, in China, 
or in North Korea, um, persecution of Christians began in 1910 under an emperor by the name of King Kim Sung, Sung's rise to, to power, and it continued under his son, and now today, his grandson, Kim Yong. And we, we hear about him in the news all the time. There's an estimated 400,000 born-again believers in North Korea today. 400,000, every one of them. Every single believer, man, woman, and child is in danger of imprisonment and brutality in that country and death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Remarkable when you think that just across the border in South Korea, the church is mighty and strong and a, a, a presence in everyday affairs in South Korea, but in North Korea, to utter the name of Jesus is a crime punishable by imprisonment, brutality, and yes, even death in that country. There is a guy by the name of Mr. E in North Korea became known as Mr. E when he was keeping his name concealed. He started three churches, underground churches, of course. It's the only way you can really start a church in North Korea. And a total in those three churches of 87 members. Then he began helping persecuted believers escape out of North Korea across the border into China. Now I want you to think about that a moment. How bad do things have to be in North Korea that it's better to go to China where, the, where, where believers are persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. But he helped them across the border to escape into China. Finally, he was arrested and he was sentenced to 18 years in prison for crimes against the government. His crime? Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Starting home churches, helping people find escape in China from the persecution in North Korea. We see this guy on the news almost every day. Well, not almost every day, but regularly, okay? The American Center for Law and Justice began promoting this. Fox News picked it up. Um, his name is Pastor Saeed. Um, he is an American citizen, and his wife is an American. His children, two children are there. He went over to, to um, Iran and was um, arrested and sentenced to prison, eight years in prison, where he is today being tortured and mentally abused in prison because of one thing, his faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know what they convicted him of? Do you know what his crime is? He helped start an orphanage. He helped start an orphanage. But he was an ordained pastor, and they didn't like his faith in Jesus Christ. They arrested him, and they threw him in prison for eight years. Our own Secretary of State is trying to get his release and brought back to this country. But a man being persecuted, a man who is suffering for his faith in Jesus Christ. But here's the truth. I don't have to go to China. I don't have to go to Korea. I don't have to go to various places in Africa. I don't have to go to the remote parts of the world that seem remote, at least from my perspective, to discover suffering because suffering has many, many different faces. In November 1987, there was a plane crash in Alaska, Homer, Alaska. One or two people on the plane actually survived. Everybody else died. Among them was my very, very best friend, Jack Couchy. Jack was an inspiration to me from the day I entered the ministry. I met him in South Dakota. We became instant friends. And eventually he moved to Alaska and then he encouraged me to move to Alaska. We served together for a time and then he went off to start other churches in Alaska. And I became the pastor of the Kodiak Bible Chapel which is where he was when I first went up there. And in 1987, I was going on my annual hunt and I called up Jack and I said, Jack, would you come over and fill in for me? He was delighted at the prospect. He flew over to Kodiak. I went hunting, and he went preaching. On my way back home, I was in a commercial fishing boat with a friend. We turned on the news, and we'd heard that a plane had crashed. And I remember looking at my friend and saying, hey, Jack was flying home today. And my friend looked at me, and he said, um, there's lots of planes, lots of planes. When I got to the dock in Kodiak to unload our deer that we had shot and our other goods, an elder from the church met me there to help me unload, which was odd, okay? And uh, finally, in a moment when I was alone, he came up to me and he said, Jack was on the plane. And, and it was a time of great grief, a great sorrow. His wife, Louise, has been a friend for all these years to this very day. 
well, Louise can't ever get her Christmas letter out on time. And so I always get her Christmas letter about this time of year. I never, do you ever, in, as a matter of fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten two Christmas letters, okay? And um, do, you, do you get Christmas letters like that? Okay, we do. Well, Louise's is always one of them. And interestingly enough, the other friend that was in the boat with me that day is the other one that we get the, the two late Christmas letters from. Louise remarried some years later, as did I after the death of my wife, and, and was very, very happily married and living in Florida. And her Christmas letter came, and I always look forward to reading her letter. It's one of the few that I look forward to. And she told me that in the story she had married this guy named Tony Macaroni. It looks like Macaroni, which I always thought was funny, Tony Macaroni. And, um, and she had married Tony and had a very, very great life with him after Jack's death. But in her letter, she said that one day her husband, who was old and frail and suffering physically and dying, held her hand and said, Louise, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm going to be with the Lord. And shortly thereafter, he stepped out of this earth and into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and forever. She wrote a handwritten note to me. And she wrote, Russell, I sure meet to Miss Tony. As you know, sudden loss is devastating. With Tony, it was two and a half years of suffering. And that's what made it so painful for all involved, too. You see, one person's suffering often brings about suffering for those who are close, for those who are near, for those who love that person, for those who help and minister and nurse and care. I was sorry to hear. She's now lost two husbands. A lot of suffering involved in that. Suffering has many faces, folks. Broken marriages bring about suffering. Chemical abuse within a home from a loved one, brings about suffering. Children making unwise decisions, have you ever had that? Brings about suffering. Unsaved loved ones can bring about a lot of suffering, sickness and disease and death, financial disaster, fill in the blank. Suffering has many, many faces. And then there's natural catastrophes that we see on the news and read about all the time. Earthquakes and hurricanes and Tsunamis, devastating, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, bringing hundreds of thousands of deaths, and what of those who are left behind and the suffering that they go through because of these natural catastrophes? And what of unnatural catastrophes? Aurora, Newtown, just what we saw this last week in Big Bear Lake, California. How many lives affected? I heard on the news that the LA Police Department posted 400 men in defense of the people that were on this one person's hit list. Imagine the sorrow, the fear, the suffering because of unnatural catastrophes. And we have experienced things on that list and things that aren't on that list. And in the midst of all of that, Paul talks about joy, joy. Um, uh, the word rejoice and the word joy re, re, are repeated over and over through the book of Philippians. And so now, so now, what? We, we have a pastor on his anniversary who's telling us in the midst of suffering we, we're supposed to be joyful? What's up with that? What's next? What's next? Telling us that we have to find joy in the midst of death? Well, um, yes, actually. Um, and come back in a couple of weeks. But are we supposed to find um, joy in the midst of suffering? Um, are, are we supposed to be joyful because of the suffering? No, no, that's not what Paul says. You see, if that was true, then the Bible would encourage us to go out and find suffering. The Bible does not encourage us to go out and find suffering. But what Paul does encourage us to do is to discover joy in the midst of those times of suffering. We discover joy in the middle of it. We find joy from the Lord in the midst of those difficult experiences in life. Remember what joy is. Joy is a spontaneous and abiding delight of my spirit. When my soul is in fellowship with God. Joy is not happiness. Happiness is the result of good fortune in my life. 
unhappiness, the result of bad fortune in my life. Fortune is fleeting. Whether it's good or bad, it comes and it goes. Happiness comes and goes. Unhappiness comes and goes. But joy, joy is spontaneous in that it is not caused by any outside event. It is a spontaneous and abiding. It doesn't come and go. It abides the spontaneous and abiding delight of my spirit when my soul's in fellowship with God. I'm happy because a good thing happens to me. I am joyful because I am in fellowship with God. And you see, the fellowship with God endures even through difficult times, even through times of suffering. And la last week we looked at loneliness. In the midst of those things that we would call negative, we can find a positive relationship with our God because we are in fellowship with him. And so there's three questions that we really need to ask ourselves when we find ourselves in the midst of suffering. Number one, will I let God do a good thing in me and in others through my suffering? Will I let God minister through me? That's why through my ministry career, I've always looked for people in my congregation that had the gift of encouragement. I look for people that maybe went through what I'm going through. They went through it successfully before. And I want to go to them and find encouragement from them. I want to find joy from them because, because they let God do a good thing in them. And they're letting God do a good thing through them to others in the midst of their suffering. Second question, will I let God purify my motives? Times of suffering can be times of refining. Refining means cooking out the bad stuff. When gold is refined, it's heated up to a temperature that causes the non-gold things to separate from the pure gold. And it, it's a fiery furnace. It takes a lot of heat. And in our lives, sometimes we go through a fiery furnace. There's a lot of heat that is pressing upon us in the form of suffering. But the question is, what am I doing with it? What am I allowing in the midst of it? What am I letting God do? Am I negative about it? Am I complaining about it? Am I calling God every sort of name? Am I demanding that God remove this from me and take this away and set me free? Or am I discovering God and letting God purify my motives? And the third thing, will I let God reorient my priorities toward the gospel? Refocus my priorities. In this world, and I'm not talking about this age, because the world has not changed since Adam and Eve until this very day, as far as world motives, world philosophy, world thought. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to look on all kinds of outside things, to concentrate on the periphery instead of on the heart of God. Will I let God reorient my priorities toward the gospel, my focus toward the gospel, my thoughts upon him and what God is doing? Three important questions to ask. Now, what I actually want to talk about is three beneficial outcomes of suffering. Because suffering is pointing us forward, and it's pointing us upward. And that's what the Apostle Paul talks about in this passage of Scripture, okay? Number one benefit is the progression of the kingdom. The key verse, the key verse, I think, in this entire section is found right here in verse 12. Take a look at it again. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Paul's in prison He's awaiting trial. He's separated from his loved ones. He's chained to guards. He's unable to be what he is, an evangelist and a preacher of the word. And he's rejoicing because his suffering has resulted in the advance of the gospel, the progression of the kingdom. What if the worst thing that ever happened to you resulted in somebody getting saved? and for all eternity, being saved from hell. Would it help you bring your suffering into perspective? Would you be willing to endure it again, that a soul might be saved? That's what Paul is saying here. I got to look at this right. The progression of the kingdom, opportunity to testify about Jesus and his suffering. The word advance in the Greek implies new territory. 
The word implies the advance of the gospel into places where the gospel could not have gone or would not have gone and never has gone before. Into virgin territory, unplowed land. New hearts, new lives, new souls, new people, new places. The gospel going where it never had gone before because Paul was suffering for the cause of Christ. In fact, the, the Greek word for advance is a military term, and it means to cut down in advance. And Paul is talking really about, in those days, the Roman armies would go into remote places and there weren't roads, there weren't interstate highway systems. And there were those who had to go ahead of time and they had to be whacking down trees and clearing out underbrush and making the way so that the army and the supplies for the army could find its way through. And Paul is saying, Paul is saying, I'm really excited about this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served as the brush clearing so that the gospel can advance into this whole new territory. What a great image. What a great picture to make a way or to make an opening for the advancement of the gospel. You see, Paul's suffering. And we're going to come back to this, exactly where the gospel advanced to. But Paul's suffering open doors that could not have been otherwise opened. That the gospel might go where it could not go before. Do you know in your life, times of suffering opens doors that have previously been unopened. When people look at you and they see what you're going through and they see your faithfulness to Christ in the midst of it, hearts open that weren't open before. Hearts become soft toward the gospel that weren't soft toward the gospel before. Lives are changed as people look at you as you are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of your suffering. You see, for non-believers to see Christ in you, that's what Paul is talking about. First of all, he says the gospel advanced. Then he said non-believers, non-believers. Look at verse 13. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. The palace guard, the Praetorian guard, okay? He's talking about the gospel going to those men, to, to that branch of the military. You see, if Christ is in us, and I want you to know this, if Christ is in us, then his presence in us is going to make a difference. If Christ is in me, his presence in me is going to make a difference how I respond to the negative things in life. How I respond to the things I don't want to happen to me. It's going to make a difference how I react to every single thing in life. If Christ is in me, something's going to be different. If nothing is different, Christ in me is doing me no good. Christ was in Paul. And in the midst of his suffering, good was coming out of Paul and rejoicing was coming out of Paul. And when Paul arrived under arrest in Rome, he was arrested in Jerusalem and transported to Rome. When Paul arrived under arrest, he was handed over by the centurion that guarded him through that whole trip and all the shipwrecks and all the difficulties. He was handed over to the commanding officer of the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard was a special group of elite soldiers in Rome that protected Rome from invaders and outsiders. They were the special ops, the Green Beret of their day. They were a group of 10,000 select troops who served for 12 to 16 years. Later, the number was added to 16,000, but at Paul's time, it was 10,000 select troops. It was a lifetime commitment, basically, that they made in their strength, in the youth of their life. They were a mighty group of men. They were skilled, mastered, and trained and prepared specifically for their job as special guard to Caesar in Rome. These were men who believed in the religion of the day, the false religions of the day. These were men who believed that Caesar was God. And anyone who didn't believe that Caesar was God in their minds was subject to punishment by death. They were the hardest of the hard. And Paul is chained to them. And Paul is rejoicing because he's saying it has become clear throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else that I'm going through this for the cause of Jesus Christ. 
we read later on that Paul sends greetings. And one of the greeters is the members of the Praetorian Guard. They're greeting a church. They've become part of the church. They've been converted to Jesus Christ. The hardest of the hard, the most difficult of difficult, the most committed of men. The gospel has advanced because of Paul's sufferings where the gospel couldn't go. And Paul says it has become clear, clear that believers, believers also are able to grow in their faith. And look at verse 14. He says, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have become encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Because of Paul's suffering, others are encouraged to do what before they didn't have the courage to do. Brothers is always, whenever used in the New Testament, is a reference to the believers, to the church of Jesus Christ. They're encouraged to speak, and they're encouraged to speak, and they become courageous, and they become fearless. The Greek word for fearless, of phobos, it's from which we get the word phobia. Phobia. They've gotten over their phobia of being afraid to speak the truth of Jesus. They've been encouraged. You see, what you experience can help others in their journey in life. We have a congregation filled with people, folks, filled with people who have gone through a multitude of things. I hope you've met my good friends, the Vosses. Some of us journeyed in prayer, and some of you women a whole lot more than that, with Barbara over the last couple of years, as she had an experience with cancer that she is now free of. Barbara, I'm going to tell you something. When this news broke and I watched you through all that, I wrote you in my book of people to go see when I'm struggling. If I ever have to experience that kind of a thing, I'm knocking on your door. And I'm saying, John and Barbara, I'm here because I saw Barbara walk through a time of suffering with a spirit of joy, a spirit of faith, a spirit of expectation as to what God is going to do. In 1996, John, what, John, you were in your 40s back then? An airline pilot in the prime of his life discovered that he had a brain tumor. How scary is that, folks? How scary is that? John told me, and, and, and I think, John, you, you talk to John, and, and he'll tell you it was a scary time. But he was excited to see what God had for him in the future. Wow, what perspective. What perspective. So John's on my list <laughs> of people to go see in my times of suffering, in my time of struggle. Some of the rest of you are on my list. I just didn't ask permission this morning if I could use your name. What you experience and what God gives you victory in can help others in their journey in life. Are you willing to let God minister through your suffering and bring you joy and bring joy to others as we focus on the greatness of God? The second thing, the second thing is the proving of the believer. You see, there are three disciplines that are at work here in verse 12. N number one is the discipline of delay. I don't know about you, but I don't really like delay. I am fortunate because I work here at the church. So I don't have to drive to work during rush hour. I can come anytime I want. I can come before or I can come after. I can go home before. I can go home after. And it's a great pleasure because I'm, t I'm here to tell you that on the way that I go home, no matter how I go home from here, okay, there's long lines of people about 5 o'clock at the stoplight. And what's up? What's up? I mean, I'm all the way back here, and way, way, way up there is the first car in line at the red light, and the light turns green, and they just sit there. What's up with that? <laughs> Quit texting. Hang up your, I got to get home, folks. The discipline of delay. But see, Paul wanted to be out spreading the word. 
He wanted to be out starting churches. He wanted to be out preaching to people. He wanted to be out praying for people and praying for victory and joy for people. And now he's sitting in, in jail, chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard, under arrest, waiting trial. Waiting. 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 The discipline of delight. Second thing is the discipline of discomfort. Come on, nobody wants to be chained to a guy day and night, 24 hours a day. Nobody wants to be so confined like that. We like freedom in life. We don't like discomfort. And the third thing is the discipline of disappointment as we learn to find our hope in God. Three disciplines. God is doing a work in us, teaching us to wait upon him, to find our strength in him, to delight in the Lord, to find our hope in Christ alone. You've heard the quote, and the third is the perspective of Christ. The perspective of Christ, okay? You've heard the quote, I don't care what the newspapers say about me. Just spell my name right. It's attributed to many, many people throughout history. P.T. Barnum is probably the one that it's most often um, um, attributed to, but who knows who really first said it. P.T. Barnum probably heard his wife say it, and she probably got it from her mother, who probably got it from who knows who. Similarly, no publicity is bad publicity. Well, Paul talks about his suffering bringing problems into perspective, bringing pain into perspective, and bringing possibilities into perspective. Take a look at it with me. First of all, problems into perspective. Verses 15 through 18, look there with me again. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether false motives are true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Uh, this morning on the way to church, my wife had to stop and buy snacks for a Sunday school class. So I dropped her off up here at HEB, and I'm sitting out waiting, and I flip on the radio. And there's a um, radio preacher. And he's talking about preachers. <laughs> and he's talking about um, his view of the Antichrist and how preachers don't like to hear the truth. And then he shares his perspective on the Antichrist. And he talks about how he's been preaching this for years and years and years, and there are people that, pastors that he talks to, and they don't like what he has to say, and they don't agree, and they're wrong, and, and on and on. So I'm sitting there listening, because I'm not agreeing with his view on the Antichrist, that I'm a guy, number one, who won't listen, and I'm a guy, number two, who apparently is not educated according to him, a guy, number three, that really doesn't understand what the Bible says, and number four, a guy that's just flat out wrong. Well, I'm thinking about that. What's my response? What's my reaction? Well, let me tell you, yeah, exactly, Keith. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I happen to know who this person is, and that as a result of his ministry and his church's ministry, that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached for years and years and years, and there are people who are going to spend all of eternity in heaven, and I don't care if he's right or wrong on the subject of the Antichrist, it's not on heaven's entrance exam. You know what's on heaven's entrance exam? What'd you do with Jesus? What you do with Jesus? I'm in heaven not because of my view on the rapture. I'm in heaven not because of my view on the Antichrist. I'm in heaven not because of my view on anything except one thing. One thing. I'm there not because I deserve it, but because the blood of Jesus Christ was shed to make payment for my sin, and by faith I accept God's free gift of salvation. That's it. So I don't really care what another person believes in that aspect. Praise God, Jesus Christ is being preached. Paul talks about bringing the problem into perspective. Number two, he talks about bringing the pain into perspective. He says, these people, these people um, are supposing they can stir up trouble for me in my chains. They're causing problems for Paul. They're saying Paul is wrong. They're saying if, if Paul was really a man of God, God would deliver him. He wouldn't be in prison. He wouldn't be suffering this stuff. He wouldn't be going through any of this. Paul says, so what? What they say? I don't care. Jesus Christ is preached. Brings pain into perspective. 
What I'm going through is okay. Jesus Christ is being preached. And the third thing, possibilities. I really like this verse. The important thing is that in every way, in every way, Paul's way and somebody else's way, in every way, Christ is preached. It brings problems into perspective. It brings pain into perspective. It brings possibilities into perspective. What God can do. Suffering gave Paul opportunity to sit and think about these things and to say, yeah, I don't like where I am, but I like what God is doing. I don't like being chained next to this guy, although now he's a believer, and at least I can pray with him and talk to him and teach him the word. But better than that, people are out there preaching the word. Jesus Christ is preached. So let me close with this. Suffering is a very real thing. We look around, as I said at the beginning, and we look so normal to eat to others. I look at you, and I just see the outside. You look at me, and you just see the outside. But we've gone through suffering, and some of us are in the midst of it now, and some of us will soon be in the midst of it, or at some time we'll be in the midst of it. I guarantee you, if you haven't suffered yet in your life, if you live long enough, you will. You will. What do you wish wasn't going on in your life today? A marriage difficulty. Financial mishap. A rebellious, a rebellious child in your home. An ailment. A disease. Something that you just wish you didn't have to endure. What do you wish wasn't going on in your life, the hurts, the sorrows, the pains of body, soul, and spirit. Right now, if you could be honest with God, and you can be, and you could say, God, this thing right here. A lot of people don't know about it. I haven't shared it with anybody, but maybe my very best friend and maybe not even them. What do you have going on that you wish wasn't there? How is God using it for your good? And how is God using it for his kingdom? I had somebody share with me this last week something that really blessed my soul. I started attending this church, so as most, most of you know, in 2005, 2006, my wife died. And, and I remember meeting with Chad because... Mark was, was um, on a sabbatical. And my family wanted a praise and worship service and a celebration of their, mom's, of their mom's death. I have four boys. And I didn't know a single name. Randy, I'm sorry, I didn't even know your name. Carrie, Todd. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know these people up here. I didn't know their names. And Chad said, no, he was our pastor then, he said, Praise and worship team will be here for the funeral. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. They didn't know my wife. And I walked in, and they were all here, and it was a glorious praise and worship service. And somebody shared with me today that they were amazed. I have four boys that lived all over the place as far away as Alaska, and they came. And they looked over at my boys who were singing and standing and lifting their hands in praise to God in the midst of the service for their mom who was gone. And this person shared how blessed they were to see those boys praising Jesus in a time of hurt. It blessed me to hear that. God's going to do a good thing, and he's going to do a good thing in you. And he's going to do a good thing through you if you surrender it to him. Close your eyes and bow your head with me. And I want you to just think about that thing.
that if you could have it taken away right now, you would, but it's not going. And I want to just take a moment of quiet, silent prayer and give you an opportunity to surrender to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to use this for your good. I want you to use this for your kingdom. I'm surrendering this to you. I want others to see that in the midst of a hurt, a sorrow, suffering, that I rejoice in my relationship with Jesus. And I want others to see Christ in me. lay it in your hands there's really nothing else we can do oh we could complain but it won't help we could become bitter but it won't change it or we can rejoice that our soul is in fellowship with our Lord and our God who's in charge of all things Father, let others see the wonder of Christ in the midst of our suffering. Amen.